starting right now. All right. Okay, we're all set. I'm gonna move this just a little up here. Um, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me. I'm really touched to meet this group. I already love you guys. It's been a great honor to be invited to talk with all of you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to present a lot of data in a, in a really short time. Philip said, you know, try to stay at 30. So I've got a lot to cover in a short period of time. But before I get into all of the photos, I wanted to give you a little bit of background um, about me. I was born and raised on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, when you are raised um, there, monarch butterflies are in your blood. As a kindergarten on, um, monarchs are in your from science to social studies to teachers just get any way to get monarchs into the curriculum. So, and then in PG, um, we have a welcome back monarchs when they come back to the overwintering site. So we've had um, in my lifetime, many, um, Moments with Butterflies, Pacific Grove is my childhood overwintering site. And I also um, used to be out on the playgrounds as a little girl and look up and went in October, November and see thousands overhead. Of course, we all know now that's just not what our um, kids are, are able to witness. So that's how I got started. Um, with this iconic butterfly was it has just been a childhood in the blood part of my life. So anyway, I um, ended up um, becoming a conservationist and I have um, an organic farm, very small 10 acres in Northern California that we farm on that I've learned a lot from that uh, made me understand about how we take care of our soil, land and air, um, olive, and we don't use um, chemicals, no pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides. So it's been an education and it's helped me to help others. And so I'm happy to share what I know. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask when Philip, I think he has it at the end, if he has it at the end, um, and I'll be happy to answer whatever you have. So here we go, are you ready with this, <laughs> with this information? Okay, so we are a group that started out small in 1971 with a handful of five. And we have grown now to over 55 staff and our work is nationwide with regional offices all over the country but we are doing a lot of work in California and that's where I come into the picture. I love Circes. They are a lot of biologists, a lot of unpretentious people with PhDs all over the place. And they um, never speak about that. They are just a amazing group of conservationists and um, biologists, entomologists researchers. It's just been a great experience working with them. And that they're in California is great because we really need them here. So we have a lot to cover and not much time. Um, so Xerces has collaborated and partnered with many organizations such as U.S. Fish Wildlife, um, Monarch Joint Venture. There's just a lot of cl collaboration and partnering that we do. And one that we did have a collaboration with was Whole Foods. Whole Foods and Cersei's wanted to raise awareness about pollinators and our food that is made to see or eat without pollinators. So this is the uh, produce part of Whole Foods with all of the produce that is there because of pollinators and without. That is how vitally important they are to our everyday life and our food. Not, as you can see, many things are not, are, um, 
are needing pollinators. Some things do get wind pollinated, but not a whole lot. Um, we also have um, dairy. So my next one slide is on dairy. So what we would have without pollinators and dairy on the top and on the bottom without, because you know alfalfa and all the other things, it's it's just very integrated. I can't do too much detail like I'd like with 30 minutes. So I'm going to have to kind of skim through. I would like to go into more detail. So if you have a question, just don't hesitate with that. So here's our um, Thursday's map of what the Western and Eastern monarchs where they uh, migrate. This migrate has been an amazing process. We're going to get a little bit to that migration also, but since we're here specifically today to talk about a specific pollinator, the western monarch butterfly for California, and why are they in such severe decline? As Philip said, it's um, as he was alarmed enough where it caught his attention, it has been devastating. And the severe decline, well, this tells you a lot. In the 80s, we had millions of Western monarchs. And now we, after the Thanksgiving um, count that is done in November, and then again, another count in January, so Xerxes collects data at each site where it's counted, a lot of detail there. And um, between Thanksgiving and thanks, um, the New Year's count, we lost even more, 37%. Um, and that count is taken the last one on January 10th. So as of January 10th, we basically have a little over a thousand Western monarch butterflies counted at our overwintering sites. Uh, why? Look at this um, from the millions to what it is in 2021. Here's a graph. We won't spend too much time on that. Another Xerxes graph after the New Year's count. The causes of the decline are loss. It's basically five. It's it's. A little complicated, but basically there's a loss of, of degradation of the overwintering sites in California. Also in Mexico, they're losing a lot of trees in Mexico too. So it's not just Westerns, but um, in California, we have a lot of situations there. The monarchs are looking for a microclimate to survive through the winter storms and and they they will go on public land private land wherever they need to find that microclimate to survive so it's a very complicated process as you can imagine to protect um, something on such a diverse uh, part of land sometimes it will be at a golf course um, where a lot of chemicals are sprayed there's just a lot of complications. This is not an easy fix. The second is loss and degradation of breeding and migrating habit habitat, which that habitat is really crucial to their survival. We think we are losing them quite possibly in the first generation when they leave the overwintering site. They are not having enough milkweed and nectar plants to fuel them to carry on the next generation. And it takes about five generations, four to five, for them to come back to the overwintering site. That first generation is pretty crucial. Um, climate change is huge to that. They're leaving the overwintering sites earlier than ever before. And that is not good because it is creating where milkweeds are not even up and erupted yet. They go dormant in the winter. So with climate change, there's not enough milkweed to sustain them. That's another problem. In California too, the pesticides are with our ag um, and in home gardens. 
our pesticide use in California is really heavy. Even you know, rice spray and mosquito spray kills them. So we are, they're um, what's kind of known as um, death by a thousand cuts. They are also known as Dr. Lincoln Bauer, who was a famous um, monarch researcher that has passed away that they, he called them the canary in the gold mine, what he, they will show us of what is our future. And also we, we are in an insect apocalypse as the New York Times uh, classified that, but the Western monarchs are what is called um, in an extinction vortex. What the Western monarchs, once they got under 30,000, um, the monarch scientists have said that that is a threshold of possible non-recovery. So then we went to um, just under 30,000 a couple of years ago to a thousand um, now. And that is a alarming thing for monarch scientists, but we are um, not giving up um, if we do not continue the conservation work, they're not going to survive. Xerxes did put in a petition in 2014 for a federal protection and we got our ruling on the 15th and the legal protection <clears throat> cannot come. It's very difficult to get protection for an insect and especially insects don't always get the love. So when we're filing this petition, and it was with a few other um, prominent conservation groups also, uh, when we got the ruling on December 15th, it was classified as warranted but precluded. What does that mean? Warranted meant that the Western monarch or the, the even the Eastern, the West, the monarch butterfly is warranted for the Endangered Species Act, meaning it met all criteria, but it did not get on the list because basically we only have so much funding for that program and there's basically a waiting list and other species are ahead. So the warranted per, but precluded will be reviewed yearly. So that's what happened December 15th. And then we tried with the state also filing and the state um, that one failed also. For, so the legal protection is not going to come for them. We will have to be doing it through community science and, our, and collectively um, for the conservation for the Western monarch. The last one is disease and parasites. Um, there is more, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that briefly also, but um, in effort to save a little time, since I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, we'll go more into that also. But those are basically the main reasons for the Western monarchs. Percy uh, started a Western Monarch call to action, and this is um, the five parts of it, is protect and manage California overwintering sites, restore breeding and migratory habit in California, habitat in California, which basically is get those milkweed plants and nectar plants planted, protect monarchs and their habitat from pesticides. Uh, Xerxes does a lot of outreach um, about protecting pollinators and about using um, insecticides and what they, what it does to them. And we have on our YouTube channel, a lot of talks about that. One recent one done about a month ago, that's fantastic that I encourage you to look at regarding pesticides and, uh, and protecting pollinators and what it does to them and alternatives to use. And that one is really helpful. And for me, who's a grower, um, that really is, um, a, a big part of my outreach. Like if I don't use this, Kim, what do I use? That's what we really need to do more of an outreach. Four, protect, manage, and restore summer breeding and fall migration habitat outside of California. 
Of course, the Western Monarch also goes to Nevada, Arizona, Utah, up through Oregon, Washington. Um, so there are a lot of um, areas that a migrating butterfly covers. And then five, answer key research questions about how to best aid Western Monarch recovery, which is part of the outreach that we do, but also there is a lot of studies that are being done and that are still needed that are going on now. And of course the wildfires in California have affected them that we need more studies on. We do know that it certainly has um, decreased uh, habitat for them. Uh, Xerces started a um, priority action zone map for California. And for Californians, this is really crucial. As you can see, um, San Maria is in priority number one. What does that mean? That means that we really prioritize that area. That is the key to their survival priority number one area. They're gonna need milkweed and nectar like crazy here in order to survive. And the little green along the coast is where milkweed should not be planted five miles uh, along the coast and then five miles in approximately where it historically natively grows for um, their, migra their migration behavior is very affected by milkweed. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but so, we're in priority number one. That is a really big deal. And so planting native milkweed is really important, but even with climate change, native milkweed, this, this one that is being talked about right here, narrow, particularis, it is not even dying to the ground anymore with our mild winters. So things that we had that used to will die to the ground, aren't dying to the ground. And that's causing a problem. It's causing um, a pathogen buildup load for them, which is killing even more. That uh, we'll talk a little bit more about either, and especially in Southern California, but it is even in the Bay Area, uh, but really Southern California, a lot of people planting tropical milkweed that was that is and continues to be sold at box stores. And that is um, chemically grown milkweed too. It's just not a good idea all the way around. So they're up against a lot of problems. Some of that with the tropical milkweed man-made problems that I'll touch on also. So what do they need? Okay, hey, butterflies and wildlife is our California quail right there. If you plant it, they will come. Uh, I put that photo there of the California quail for you guys because I have always also had a thing for California quail. And I had read that if you plant black sage, you'll have a quail. So I did. And I planted it. You need some room for it. It, it gets huge. And now I have a family of 20 in my pollinator garden at home. So what do they need? Okay, Kim, you tell us all of this. What do we need to do? This is part of why I, um, I do all this talking. Plant high quality nectar plants. So what does that mean? That's confusing for a lot of people. That's where I'm here to help. That's not your going to your box star, box store and getting impatience or hydrangea. That's not going to feed them. And this is where I do a lot of emailing, getting phone calls, and also in these talks and giving um, links of how to find what, how people are going to find these plants. That's the crucial part. So gathering and knowing the native plants that are adapted to your area, number one are 
crucial because those are the plants they evolved with Western monarchs and also the ones that keep them the healthiest and usually the ones that do not have a lot of pests and also will be so drought tolerant that they will keep producing nectar in um, those hot parts of our summers. So that I could probably do a whole talk on. So I'm gonna have to skim over some stuff to stay in that time, but that's crucial. And so one of the ways is how to get these um, California native plants is go to your, with high nectar value, is to support your local native nurseries and your local California Native Plant Society chapter plant sales, which is really great timing because most California Native Plant Society plant sales are in the spring and the fall. They usually have two, and most of them are starting next week. I think there's 30 chapters of CNPS chap, uh, chapters in California, and they'll be selling their native plants and milkweeds, um, most of them starting around May 20th. And I checked your local chapter and on their website, they are starting a plant sale um, on the 20th. So if you sign up for their newsletters, they will not notify you when their plant sales are held and give a lot of great advice on your local regional native plants that are sometimes hard to find, but they'll grow them, propagate them, and sometimes it's the best place to get them. Okay, I love this photo from Xerxes for a lot of reasons. Um, what can we do specifically to increase habitat? and your gardening community can be part of the solution. So basically let's start right here at the farm. Here's an organic farm. They often, a lot of them are small, um, like mine, only 10 acres. They are labor intensive. They're trying to grow a lot of really great food, work on the soil. Here's a hedgerow, an insectary strip. So it's really important that we support our local organic farms. They are creating great habitat and they're also not um, doing damage to pollinators. Now across the street from this house, here's a habitat that was built like a little, little um, area that just had a little slope and they put in California aster. Um, speciosa, a native milkweed, some native uh, rutabecchia, and here we have um, some native echinacea, and here we have a thriving habitat. Sometimes a lot of us think, well, the little bit that I do doesn't make much of a difference, and the studies are that home gardens are enough to bring species back. So our home gardens make that much of an impact of getting the nectar and the milkweed planted and not having that heavy chemical load that they have in California. And then I love this for the house and the slope. Here's the slope and the sod. And with sod, it's tricky because the only way it can look good is with a lot of water and fertilizer. And here we have a slope and where does that go? All that fertilizer, which is heavy nitrogen for sod, goes down in our gutters, our streams, our creeks and our rivers and often goes to uh, wildlife. Um, there's big studies in Salinas where the frogs are, um, their sexual maturity is even being reversed. There's just a lot of, things that this water runoff does. But it looks like this yard is, it's good in, in good shape. But I look at it and I look at it as a blank canvas. Here is an opportunity for more plants. And now I won't have to water them as much. I won't have to fertilize them. And once they're established, they'll survive the hot summers. In our climate, in California, we have Mediterranean climate 
it's not where we have winter rains like areas back east mediterranean climate um, means we have dry summers uh, dry hot summers and it's not made for lawn and so we have to rethink our aesthetic like for me this is what i think is beautiful no lawn they've put in pollinator plants socked it in there and this one is not all native like this one they do have a little patch of lawn with some natives but most of it is natives and hardly any lawn so if somebody really wanted a little sod okay but can we maybe give a little bit of room to the pollinators so that's why i did both choices like to in the, these are two examples of rethought sod and then after you get that great pollinator garden going Xerxes has a new habitat sign that is great for neighbors to see and then it increases interest of I planted a pollinator garden. I'm not using pesticides to keep all these pollinators from not dying after they visit. And it, I put mine out, it generated a lot of interest. Um, Xerxes put their 300 left after the new one came and they were giving away free their old ones. This new one is new, very new. And th they had requests for the old one in two minutes. They had to close down the entry. They're just really popular, these habitat signs. And here's a California aster, that's a blazing star. So we're, we're needing to rethink our aesthetic, what, what is beautiful to us. Here's more help. This is the Xerxes website on native nectar plant resources. And I put the website there, Philip's recording this. So all this information on these links you'll be able to have. And that's really helpful too. And it'll go into regional, this one, California. Um, and then the, when it blooms so that you'll know when bloom push out happens. Um, Calscape, uh, here's their website. You can put in your address right here. They have a search bar. Put in your address and they'll show you. This is the PG Sanctuary in Pacific Grove, the Monarch Sanctuary. So you can put in your address and it'll show you all the native plants, even for your street. It's just a great resource. Here's a um, native plant for my CNPS that I bought in my pollinator garden. Again, um, what can we do to feed the hungry monarchs? Again, practice conscious gardening, plant nectar. Uh, if I buy this plant, is it going to feed a pollinator or not? Is it just going to, you know, be environmental and not do very much or is it going to actually help a beneficial. So when I buy something, I think, okay, I am going to su support birds, bees, beneficial insects, butterflies, native bees. I'm not just going to put a plant in the ground. It has to serve a beneficial purpose and support biodiversity, which, you know, one bird um, for egg to fledging takes 1400 insects per bird. Then you multiply that four or five in the nest. Insects are extremely beneficial. Only 3% of all insects have been designated pests. The rest, 97%, are all serving a purpose to biodiversity, supporting wildlife. So the 3% of, of insects have really made it really difficult for the beneficials. Again, your local native plant nurseries and, and CNPS chapter website is a valuable place to start. Um, Calscape is developed by C California Native Plant Society and a lot of other organizations that supported it. And I put your local um, California Native Plant Society website right here on the page for you for 
your recording that Philip is doing. Okay, also another thing to uh, remember is planting for diversity of year round bloom, which means that they, especially Western monarchs, they need food in the fall and winter when they're there and the early spring. But not so much in the summer for Western monarchs, for pollinators, yes, especially native bees, but um, and hummers, hummingbirds do migrate, but some because of climate change are, are staying in our areas. But for Westerns, it's fall, winter, and summer bloom. And there's a lot of help on what plants provide that and support that too. Here's some buckwheats that I grow. I grow California coast and native buckwheats. Um, Western monarchs, I'm gonna just very quickly go through some photos of what do they love. They love those disc type plants, but it could be tubular also. So I'm gonna really quickly not get too scientific here, but show you some the beauty of California natives. This one's in my pollinator garden. That's a buckwheat. This is again a California buckwheat with an um, with Coast Angelica. That um, butterfly right here is um, an El Segundo uh, butterfly. Buckwheat support um, a lot of butterflies. And we have a lot of declining insects besides Western monarchs. The Smith blue is another one in severe decline that buckwheat support. We just, all of this is beneficial for many things that are um, species that are struggling. Here's goldenrod and Pacific aster. Those are both uh, fall blooming. So I put those together for you and they are gorgeous in the fall. This one is so loaded with the nectar that sometimes it's seeping. Western monarchs love this one. Manzanitas are another high quality nectar. This yellow one is woolly sunflower. These are all natives. This one is yarrow, uh, common yarrow, a California native yarrow. Um, some of the cultivars will still have nectar, but maybe not as much as the natives. So one can have um, beauty. And in that beauty of changing the color, sometimes the nectar has dropped. So that's why I'm showing California natives going through for that monarch value plant and also for that high nectar. So this is woolly sunflower common yarrow, spice bush, which supports a lot of butterfly hosts. It's a big butterfly host plants for swallowtails and anise swallowtail. And then um, California larkspur. Percy's has a new book coming out um, in about two, three weeks. I think the publication date is April 4th. That one's gonna be really helpful to help people also know what to plant. Um, it's in the, let's see if I'm, I can show it to you. I have to pull my screen. I pulled it over. It's in the same venue as Cersei's B book. Let me see here. Uh, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to waste the time. We have a B, it's, it's a B book, 100 plants to feed the bees. This one is just for monarchs. Another very user-friendly book of what to plant and uh, depending on where you live, even will help you color coordinate your pollinator landscape design. And that one um, is available on the Xerces website, Amazon, you know, wherever somebody wants to buy books, a local bookstore will be available for special order, but that one will be really useful on, on what to plant. So that's, that I can send um, an email to Philip, but I believe they changed it to the end of March, March 30th release date, and I think it's April 4th now. Okay, now it's not just about planting milkweed, it's also about protecting them. 
Here is an early emerging milkweed, Californica, that is really needed. And then off to the right is um, some native milkweed that was affected by a chemical spray of a nearby farm in drift. So we are always, immense work is always being done to keep the food chemical free for them too. They're just, they're just um, feeding from uh, farm strips. Sometimes commercial farm strips will grow milkweed. Um, there is a lot of funding for farmers to grow it. There will be highways, um, roadsides. That was a chemical drift from um, Roundup Glossophate. Uh, this one we could spend a lot of time on, but like I talked about, this, Circe's has a whole talk on to help with pesticides. So I really encourage you to look at that one on Xerces um, web page on uh, YouTube, and it's so informative. We have a new um, program out. We just did a webinar on this also about buying bee safe plants. Um, a study was done purchasing a lot of plants from a lot of different areas and plants in the ground also, but a lot of these plants in a lot of nurseries and these big commercial growers, um, they use preventive measures, which gives a big chemical overload because that is more convenient for them. So instead of using the chemicals on outbreak, they do it on preventive. Um, and there, it's a lot of work to grow plants. Our consumer demand is that we have these big, full, healthy plants and we're getting um, a huge pesticide, insecticide, load into our plants, the plants uptake the into the plant tissue. And a lot of these are that are used sometimes are um, the ones that really becoming a problem are systemic ones that are neonicotides, neo, neonics, the systemic um, chemicals are often in the plant tissue for at some, some years, especially neonics. So this um, is to help the consumer of how to buy be safe plants and then one to give your nursery to help them. And the more that they are requested with consumer power, the more um, they will request the grower to please provide pesticide free plants. We're having consumers saying they're starting all these pollinator gardens, which are now so popular and now they put a, a neonic plant in their pollinator garden and killing um, the pollinators. So we are we have much information on this, and this has a PDF on our website. So this is more on source um, carefully. Here is the study on the residue found in the um, milkweed, and there's other studies on nursery plants. So we won't go into all that scientific part with a short talk, but it's available to studies if, if you want to read those. Here's a nursery card at one of the partners, Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. Um, they do great work in what, if, what do I use if I don't use a pesticide? And they developed a nursery card, a postcard. Also California native, Plant Society have a sticker that you buy um, a plant from them, you're guaranteed it wasn't grown with pesticides and you put in your pollinator garden, it won't harm a plant. This one's a little involved. We'll have to skip through. This could take a while with our monarch Actually, uh, milkweed Kim, member. Kim, Kim, this is, this uh, is a very valuable tool. Kim, Kim this is uh, Philip. Hi, Philip. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I was hoping to save a little time for questions. We're coming up to our seven o'clock hour. I know we started okay. a little bit late, so you have a few yeah. minutes, but if you could like- Yeah, we started late. Yeah, if you could wrap it up a little bit, just so that we, I know my, I know my peeps, they're gonna wanna ask you some questions and I probably yeah. have a couple myself. So if you could save a little time, maybe 
Yeah. I, I, we're not opposed to having you come back. Don't feel you have to squeeze it all in right now. I, I, uh, I, I think there would be interest in a, in a second uh, presentation. Yeah. And it's so much information and let, let's kind of go to the main things. Cause this is a little involved this, and let me go to the main slides. We're at the end and then yeah, the, the Q and A is so important. So let's go through this super fast. That's, this is available when you see a monarch to report it, sit community science, a monarch, adult monarch, or an egg or breeding pair. And then that is uh, right here is the information. As you see, Santa Maria is not doing too much reporting, but that might change how to find um, natives where they're supposed to grow from Calscape. Um, the problem with tropical milkweed, the OE parasite that is very um, damaging to monarchs, killing them. We also have habitat kits for uh, organizations, businesses, parks, um, all kinds of um, organizations are, and they're free, they, you apply, it'll be opened up in April. And then the early emerging milkweeds, community science is so crucial. So we have the Westerns for our um, children to be able to see one day. Here's more information from Xerces. And at the end, a lot of people are doing this conservation work. Now that we feel really beat up, because, um, wow, you know, it's hard because they've gone through a lot, but um, they're pretty, they keep going as much as they can. They're resilient. And then we have to also not lose hope, keep going, because if we don't, they, they um, could not recover without conservation. So don't lose hope. There's a lot that still can be done. And that, that is being done. And thank you so much. Okay, I'm open for questions. Anything that you wanna ask, please go ahead. Okay, I'll go. Um, okay, I'm very interested in gardening and planting the, the proper plants to preserve the monarchs. And can we buy those plants from this, um, what, whatever the society in slow, or just get the list of plants there and order them somewhere else or what? Like it's not, yeah, we can't plant, just go um, to. Yeah, to get those high quality nectar plants that really feed them, go to your local California um, nursery for, um, I did a little bit of research where yours is and Fran, um, it is, there's, you guys are kind of in an interesting area because you are in kind of the native plant grower Mecca area where a lot of wholesale native plant growers are growing. Mm -hmm. um, there are like Las Palitas, they are a wholesale grower, but they are open retail, but with COVID, they haven't quite fully opened, but Las Palitas is amazing. They have an amazing website and that is close to you. They should be probably opening, maybe I'm gonna be hopeful a month at two at the most, but right now on their website, when I checked today, it said their retail is still closed, but they supply to many, native nurseries, they're a wholesale grower. And the other is Santa Barbara Natives. They have um, a wonderful California native nursery that is really loaded. And again, their website is really informative. So you could go to, to just Google, because with your addresses, I don't know your addresses, what would be closest. I just did San Maria area. Mm -hmm. But there are California native, um, California native plant nurseries, retail nurseries in your area. Even though you guys are wholesale grower mecca for native growers, there are retail places also. 
Okay, and then just Google what did you say? Native, um, California? Native California Native Plant Nurseries. Okay. Yeah, California Native Plant Nurseries. Okay, and then they would be grown without pesticides. We don't have to inquire, or we just right. assume that the, they're the, safe. Yeah, the the native plant nurseries do not grow with pesticides. Okay, good. If they use anything, they only do it at outbreak, not preventive treatments, but outbreak, and they would use something like neem oil, nothing systemic. So nothing. Okay, you nothing. could feel confident to buy a plant that won't harm anything once you put it in your pollinator garden they just don't use that those types of chemicals at all okay this is great yeah. new uh, ideas george, for spring planting yeah I'm, I'm going through the same thing georgia you you have to unmute though yeah you have to unmute georgia you have to unmute sorry do most hi georgia plants require hi do most of the plants require full sun or are there? Um, I'm going to say well? a big portion, portion of them do, but that one um, website that I showed you, Calscape, yeah. that one will show you shade plants, California native shade plants. Okay. They'll have all those categories. So okay. not Perfect. all California natives have to have full sun like okay. one example is um california golden current it likes shade and it likes to be under trees and it doesn't always mm -hmm. want full uh, sun and when the pollinator pollinates it the ins it's a gorgeous one the inside then goes from yellow to orange once it's uh, pollinated it mm -hmm. was one of my favorite plants that I bought Georgia that of California natives when I started to get into them and research them okay. and another yeah. is hummingbird sage which smells so great they do not need full sun either perfect so Thank when you. you go on Calscape just hit that category of um, shade plants if you need okay. that well thank you you're welcome. Hello, hello, David Bixby. Thanks for joining us. Um, Hi, David. Just so you know, we are uh, we did record this one, so if you missed part portion of it, you can watch it later. It was quite fascinating. Does anyone else have a question? I do have one. Okay, Carlos, go ahead. Yeah, let me put my hand down. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, first, uh, uh, Ms. John, thank you for the presentation. I really, it was really interesting. I, thank you, I, it, Carlos. You can tell that you love, you love what you do. So that's that's great, and uh, thank it's refreshing you. to hear um, people always with that passion. Thank you. And, I love being a conservationist, well, especially pollinators you. are so important. <laughs> yeah, it's it's time that I love. Yes, thank you, Carlos. And 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 it was. Two weeks ago, uh, approximately, that uh, the city of Santa Maria, we uh, we recognized the uh, uh, the day of the uh, tree day, so plant a tree. That's the incentive. So we're trying to encourage people to to plant a tree, and I decided, uh, actually unintentionally, <laughs> to, to tell the truth, uh, my dad and I we <laughs> went about a, a tree of um, uh, it was a orange tree and uh, pitch tree. Okay. Uh, is there any benefit to to the uh, butterflies or the or any kind of uh, insect or animal to for those trees or specifically just the ones that you mentioned? You know there are um, especially the peach um, you'll see a lot of honeybees, uh, European honeybees. We don't talk about those because they're considered an ag crop. We, at Xerces, we talk about native bees, but I have my peach trees right now blooming and there are um, European honeybees and native bees all over that. So you're gonna feed a lot of bees during bloom time. But also they do offer biodiversity with birds and wildlife um, loving, all of that, sometimes the insects, the birds will eat the insects on uh, the peach trees. So yes, they are, even though um, we look at things as food crop, 
they are still helping biodiversity. And the citrus is a tricky thing because um, we have they're very prone to pests and they are heavily treated in nurseries, especially Southern California with the ciliated aphid that hit some citrus um, that came up, uh, was introduced and is working its way up the state of California. It's a very hard thing to buy citrus not tr heavily treated. Um, I did have mine tested. I grow a lot of citrus. Meyer lemon, different, all the blood orange, different varieties of blood orange, kumquat, mandarins, um, navel oranges. And I had my tissue sampled. And even though I planted them 15 years ago, all of them had a degree still of residue. And I think about mm. the bees on it. Unfortunately, it's really tricky with citrus. We are, um, we are in a area, um, you can buy organic citrus, not as easy to find, but the big growers will be treating it. So the bees will be visiting it. Like mandarins do not need a, um, a pollinator. In fact, sometimes when they are, it will make the mandarins, the seedless mandarins have seeds. Sometimes the commercial growers, Carlos will cover them. But that's just a really tricky one to be like, yeah, that one's going to be okay. It's just... It's just, it has a lot of pest citrus. Uh, thank you. Got it, thank you. Uh, you. So he was betting for, he was betting 500 on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> one good one for pollinators and, and one, you know, maybe not so good. <laughs> yeah, your poll the pollinators hey. are probably loving your peach tree yeah, right Carlos, now. Carlos, not, not bad for uh, blind luck though. So that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, my only, question is more of a comment. I the, the one thing that you told me that was really interesting was the number of insects that are required to help higher life form like a baby bird. And I, it reminded me the fact that one of the important reasons for protecting the monarch is not just because they're pretty, but they're an important food source for other animals. And it's the great chain of being. Um, you know, the the insect is eaten by the bird is eaten by this and you know it becomes food for that and and then you know ultimately us so i think that was um something i really gained uh, just an appreciation like the you like you were saying the 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 insects don't get any respect they're the rodney dangerfield of the animal <laughs> kingdom right yes. <laughs> the insects don't get love they, they don't, don't get, get the enough respect love. Yeah. you know but they're so important you know yeah. Um, and I think that was one reason why, I mean, I've slowly dawned, that slowly dawned on me. And, and when I saw that article uh, in about yeah. the monarch, it kind of prompted me into a, a feeling that we needed to take some sort of action. And I'm really pleased that it's not, you're not asking that much of us. You're asking us to plant some different plants in our garden and to ask our nurseries that we support anyway, to buy the plants that are best for our region. So that's not too much to ask. And uh, my it's wife, doable. Yeah, it's my doable. wife has been telling me that she wants a change in the front yard. She's tired of the weeds in our garden. We don't use pesticides because we have a dog and we weren't going to do that. Uh, we also just don't, you know, want to do that. So uh, I said, well, let's go native, you know, let's do native species. And so this is very timely for me because I'm going to uh, explain to her the importance of picking not only just California native species, but you know, high quality nectar and, and, and plants that are good for, for pollinators. So uh, in about six months, you guys are all gonna see a picture of my front yard. It's <laughs> totally different. <laughs> you made my night, Philip. Okay, oh, when, and that's when great. all Me of too. you need my help you know me too. that's a great thing of talking to a small group email me and i'll i'll help you just <laughs> say you know yeah, georgia you're like okay kim you said this but now i ran into this stumbling block what do i do well, so really just use me i am that's that's my joy that we get these plants out in the ground and you know if you plant it they will come like i told you about the quail and i have to see a note this right now um a Julia Phelps and a Concha that is loaded. And I, 
I think I went out and a hundred bees were on it. And then I have an apricot mm -hmm. mallow. One time I, that's gorgeous orange flower, California native. I, one time I went and I counted, there were 45 different pollinators on it. Oh, so wow. the joy <laughs> of a pollinator garden is there's so much activity and, and wildlife that comes like right now, I, I keep um, always referring to Doug Tallamy. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's a, a professor back East that does talks. I heard him the first time in Palo Alto. He'll change your life. And he talks about why we need to plant native for biodiversity, for wildlife. And he, his talks go into all of that. Of course, I tried to, this is a Western monarch talk, but if you, go on YouTube and look up Doug Tallamy. He'll, he'll crack open your brain. He's just amazing. Wait, spell his name. What is it now? It's Doug and it's T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He has okay. a couple of books out, um, but his YouTube talks are just right there. So that'll be really helpful in getting, um, understanding that everything that you do is going to help not just Western monarchs, but all these other species yes, that need this that's help. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, so it's not time or work uh, wasted, even if we cannot get their numbers up. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to say, if, uh, even if even if our efforts in response to trying to help the Western monarch doesn't really wind up helping the Western monarch, it will have an effect helping other pollinators, and that that's a good thing. So I was going to ask Peter. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking we could maybe talk to uh, Frank at Growing Grounds and see if we can't collaborate with him to have them grow some native species in addition to the vegetables that they plant. That's an organization that we support uh, developmentally nice. uh, disabled. Uh, that you know, would be, I was just explaining. I, to I him. agree, that would be a good idea. I was also yeah. thinking, and I don't know what the feasibility with this, but we belong to a group of, of three other clubs in the area and we all combine forces for Rotary Park at Robin Ventura Park. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little swath, just a little patch of yes. land that we could plant some of these? Oh, great idea. Yeah. I have to work with uh, Rec and Parks on that, but you know, I know those people from my, I used to work for the city of Santa Maria. So uh, I kind of know those people, I, can, I got an in. So that's a great idea, Peter. I think we okay. should pursue both of those. Um, and actually our club is doing a, uh, uh, there's a peace project we're participating in with our DDF, our all $335 of it. Um, well, we're <laughs> matching it, so it's about $750. And, and Dick, thank you for working on the uh, the application. But we're going to be donating a park bench in an area that's going to be dedicated to uh, trees that are planted from seeds mm -hmm. from the uh, trees that survived the Hiroshima blast in, on the anniversary of the, you know, dropping of the atomic mm -hmm. bombs. And, uh, yeah. It might be a good opportunity to start, start some discussions about, you know, the plants that are going to go around there. We can emphasize yeah. native plants. And, and uh, I'm sure that the uh, Rec and Park people at the city of Santa Maria are probably a lot of them know this already. Um, and a lot of them, if they don't, they would be open to it. So that's a great suggestion. And Kim, do you good mind? Good job, Peter, you... because I heard of Growing Grounds also. And remember too, Peter, in your outreach and all of you, that if you think of somebody, an organization, a group. Uh, we have free habitat kits that Xerxes will give out right. and it will be in the habitat kits. It is mm. um, I, a lot of plants. I think about 1500 and milkweeds. It will be regional and appropriate. And those that we got a donor of some, we're expanding it twice as big as last year. We have a um, a donor that's really uh, wanted to support us in our work in <clears throat> habitat kits, and those are all free going to um, organizations and that you fill out the application. And, and especially if you're in priority one, it really is prioritized. So Okay, so Kim, a lot of groups. I, I'm sorry to qualify. cut you off, but I I, I want to like respect our time. We're already really over 17 minutes over our time, so <laughs> I'm gonna wrap this up. But I, I am. Can can we have you come back at another time? Uh, would sure. you be willing to speak again? 
Absolutely. maybe on, uh, expanding on this or, or delving into some of the detail that you weren't able to. Would that be okay? Absolutely, yes. And, you know, there's a lot covered in this from native plants, nectar, you know, there was a lot to cover. And so, no, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. And if you taking on projects, you need more of a native plant talk, okay. let, you know, let me know. I'll work with you on that. And I promise you, we'll get a bigger crowd because I'll either make it invite <laughs> some other clubs or uh, our youthful uh, interactors or somebody will get you a good 30 people at least. So, um, I oh, you know, Philip, I've loved this after that 450 um, <laughs> people, this has been, this feels really nice. And I love this group. So it's been such a pleasure. And it, so if you need yes. me, reach out and we're there in our outreach and support. So use, use us and I'll, I'll give Philip um, permission. You guys can have my personal email and I'll just support your endeavors in any way I can. Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, normally our club would, uh, as a thank you gift, would donate a book to a public library, um, you know, usually a kid's book to the one of the local schools in, in your name to, to donate. But I think we should donate, we should purchase one of your books from Xerxes and donate it to a high school library or something. So uh, we'd be in touch about that. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank Especially you. the new book, the Monarch one. Yeah, that's, that's going to be that's really. The one I was, that's when I was thinking. Wanted. About. Yeah. yeah. I thinking I give Dirk, Xerxes a little love back by buying a book or two, and then uh, we can donate it to a library and, and double the double yeah. the love. So. Mm. And this one's really popular too. The gardening yep. for butterflies. Yeah, How come I can't get that? <laughs> I can't get that in there. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. But this one too. It it's pictured in the one of the slides. So yeah. thanks. That's really nice. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Kimberly. And what yeah. is your email address? Well, I'll, I'll um, send that out. Yeah, um, I'll give it, because this is yeah. going to be, uh, I think it might not be on a private YouTube. So oh, okay. I'll let right. Philip yeah. email okay. the group. Yeah, I'll okay. mail, email the group and it will be published. Uh, we, you don't have to worry about too many hits. I don't think we have any fans on our page. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We're working on that. But, well, uh, you know, I'll, one step I'll in. help you guys as much as I can on directing. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much.